concept of liquid dosage form is broader. The liquid dosage form can be broadly classified into monophasic liquid dosage forms or biphasic liquid dosage forms. Today's coverage would be mainly emphasized on monophasic liquid dosage forms. Monophasic liquid dosage forms are single phased liquid preparations. They are having either one or more pharmaceutically active ingredient and generally it is dissolved in a suitable solvent. Monophasic liquid dosage forms can be used either internally or externally. When they are meant for internal use, they are either solutions and these solutions have to be either aqueous based or hydroalcoholic based preparations. The monophasic liquid dosage forms, if they are intended for external use, these solutions can be aqueous or non-aqueous based. In order to understand the concept of monophasic liquid dosage form, especially on the route of administration, one has to look into the classification criteria. Based on the route of administration, it is important that we categorize them into different headings. The first classification for monophasic liquids which are especially based on route of administration that is internal use. The monophasic liquids can be categorized into aqueous monophasic liquids and hydroalcoholic based preparations. Under aqueous preparations, we have number of choices which can be mixtures, solutions, syrups, linctus, draughts or drops. Individually, we will be looking into it further. If we are talking about monophasic liquids based on route of administration for internal use and hydroalcoholic based, we have elixirs. The second criteria of classification based on route of administration is oral but meant for topical purpose. They include mouthwashes, gargles, sprays and throat paints. The monophasic liquids based on route of administration which have to be instilled into body cavity. So this includes doches, enemas, ear drops, nasal drop or nasal spray. Based on route of administration, the fourth classification of monophasic liquids are solutions, sprays, lotions, liniments, paints and collodions. So first looking into the liquid preparations which are meant to be used orally but for topical use include gargles. Looking in depth about gargles, gargles are generally defined as clear solutions which are used in the posterior region of the mouth. So generally they are used by agitating the solution with exhaled air in order to produce local effect in throat. So basically these are meant to overcome sore throats and to treat throat infections. And it is very important to mention with respect to gargles that they should not be swallowed in larger quantities. So as mentioned by definition, they are monophasic liquid dosage forms meant for oral, topical use, clear preparations used in the posterior portion of the mouth or region of the mouth to bring about local effect in the throat. And very important to mention not to be swallowed. And most of the gargles are generally used for deodorizing property in order to have a good freshness in the mouth and also to treat mild infections. Devising the formulation of gargles, one has to select the following ingredients with utmost care. The first and foremost is if the gargle is meant for a deodorizing property or for treating sore throat or mild sore throat infections, the first criteria of selection should be what is the basic active ingredient to be selected. So the selection could be out of broadly either from antiseptics category or analgesics or astringents or from alkalizing agents. The drugs generally either of the above categories if the drugs are selected some model drugs mentioned here are phenol, thymol, menthol, senol, methyl salicylate, povidone iodine, potassium chlorate, ferric chloride, borax and sodium carbonate. So once the model drug has been selected, the next criteria of selection would be the solvent system. 
So, solvent system as I already mentioned, the first solvent system is of choice is water. So, these are aqueous based solutions. So, water is the solvent system taken. But in addition to water, other pharmaceutical additives which are selected includes glycerine. Now, glycerine is the choice in case of formulation of gargles. The first being that it could itself be used as a vehicle and also not only as a vehicle, it brings about other roles like it imparts viscosity. It also gives demulcent action that is soothing effect on the throat when it is sipped slowly and it is gargled out. And it is sweet in taste when taken in mouth and also it helps as a co-solvent by bringing about enhancement of solubility. So, glycerin is the one which is generally preferred additive to be added in gargles. Now, whenever gargle is to be prepared and compounded, the first criteria to be borne in mind is dissolution. That is, the drug should be highly soluble in the selected solvent system and the methodology in its preparation would be to dissolve the drug in three-fourth volume of the total solvent and other additives which already I have mentioned which may be flavoring agent, coloring agent, preservative or maybe pH adjustments that is buffering agent. So, on selection all have to be dis dissolved in three-fourth the volume of the solvent the drug is to be dissolved and remaining one-fourth volume other additives of the formula are to be dissolved and both the mixtures are to be mixed ultimately. And finally, the preparation should be adjusted to volume with respect to the plain vehicle system which is chosen. And it is very important to mention that generally gargles are concentrated preparations. So, it is important that whenever the label on the gargle is to be pasted, it should have the proper instructions stating that gargles are concentrated solutions and it should be diluted with warm water before gargling. So, the consumer should be made aware that these are concentrated preparations and they need to take water, boil it and not exactly boil it, warm it and use as a diluent and then take it in the posterior portion of the mouth and gargle. The gargle whenever are formulated, a formulation chemist has to bear in mind the selection of the right container and the storage conditions. The containers which are preferred for packing gargles are fluted bottles. Now, fluted bottles are generally for two reasons. One reason is that they are colored, they are attractive and the acceptability by patient will be better. And also sometimes the fluted bottles help in masking the color of the preparation. When talking about storage of gargles, the gargles have to be stored in tightly closed container especially in cool and dry place. This is very important because glycerin is generally added in gargles. Glycerin being a trihydric alcohol, it has a tendency to escape in the atmosphere if it is exposed. So, it is always preferred that the preparation should be labeled with proper instructions of storage. So, in this case, it should be labeled as store in a tightly closed container and the storage condition should be cool and dry place. Also, in addition to this general information, it is important to mention the auxiliary condition which the consumer should be aware of. First and foremost, it should be stated that though it is a monophasic liquid oral topical use, this should be labeled as for external use only. The patient or the consumer is not supposed to swallow gargle. The preparation has to be gargled and thrown out of the mouth. And also the label should have the condition that not to be swallowed in larger quantities. So, these are referred as auxiliary condition. In addition to general labeling requirements, additional information is referred as auxiliary labeling condition. Whenever a pharmacist is dispensing this gargle preparation to a consumer or a patient, it is very important to do patient counseling. So, while giving instruction to the patient, it is important that the pharmacist delivers the right instructions which include that dilute the gargle with warm water before use and also to mention not to be swallowed in excess when, when gargled. 
a prescription example with respect to gargle this is a developed formulation and a very popular preparation referred as potassium permanganate gargle this is also official in national formulary in 1979 edition the formula ingredients are potassium permanganate 25 grams and the vehicle is water which is freshly boiled and cooled in order to make 100 grams so the methodology of preparation or the compounding procedure is already mentioned it's very clear weigh the specified quantity of the solid that is the api or the active ingredient and dissolve it in 3/4 volume of the water and make up the volume with remaining quantity of the solvent and bottle it the basic principle in this preparation is that potassium permanganate which is taken has an oxidation or oxidizing property and this is having a better solubility of one part in 16 parts so a gargle which is prepared is a very clear preparation by dissolving potassium permanganate in water and the main purpose of using this preparation is for cleansing mouth cleansing deodorizing and if sometimes used externally it also helps in disinfection now gargle generally are preparations because they are very clear preparations the strength of the preparation generally is preferred to be 1 in 4000 solution exclusively talking about the category of potassium permanganate gargle it can be taken as an antibacterial antifungal and a disinfectant the second formulation under monophasic liquids which are meant for oral but topical use are mouthwashes by definition mouthwashes are clear solutions now mouthwashes are generally intended to be used in front of uvula uvula is a tongue kind of portion in the posterior portion of the mouth and the main purpose of using mouthwash is to clean and refresh the mouth whenever a mouthwash is used it may be used for only cleansing but also it might be used to treat diseases of oral mucous membrane also to cure malodor that is bad breath sometimes due to tooth decay malodor is seen so in such context mouthwash is been prescribed a mouthwash is generally for cosmetic value to have mouth hygiene but also it helps in medicinal purposes a mouthwash formulation whenever is considered or selection has to be made the first criteria to be borne in mind is selection of the correct active pharmaceutical ingredient the api could be either from an antiseptic category or an astringent category and the vehicle which is selected is generally water and the water should also be pleasantly flavored so we need to consider that since it's an oral preparation it has to have good patient acceptability so organoleptic criteria should be selected with utmost care and also important to mention with respect to mouthwash is that it should be used after dilution with warm water so generally mouthwashes available in market today are ready to use but otherwise also preferences availability of mouthwashes so the labeling instruction should be read carefully and accordingly the patient should be counseled of dilution with warm water and not to be swallowed in larger quantities so whenever we are talking about the mouthwashes compounding the same methodology is adapted which is adapted in case of solutions that is the whole volume of the formula is divided into two parts the first part having 3/4 capacity should be taken wherein the drug should be dissolved and solubility should be effected and then the remaining additive should be dissolved in the solvent system which is the 3/4 volume and then final volume adjustment should be made with the 1/4 volume of the solvent which is left behind talking about the containers for mouthwashes again it is important to mention here that mouthwashes are generally packed or stored in fluted bottles so fluted bottles are from mainly selected from stability and cosmetic purview so when we talk about fluted bottles since these are for cosmetic value it is important that the bottle be attractive and the patient acceptance becomes better talking about storage of mouthwashes the mouthwashes also are recommended to be stored in tightly closed containers and the storage condition is to be stored in cool place again as the co solvency can be can be taken into account while devising the formulation of a mouthwash 
these solvents can volatilize if packed not correctly or stored correctly the additional labeling requirements to the regular labeling conditions include it's though meant for oral use but again this is only for topical purpose that is for cosmetic value of cleansing the mouth it should have a label condition that for external use only it is only when to be mentioned that it is to be taken in the mouth the mouth is to be rinsed and the preparation has to be thrown out that's why it has been referred as for external use only and very important to mention that this is an external use preparation and it should not be swallowed in larger quantities whenever we talk about dispensing mouthwashes or giving it to the patient the patient should be given the right instruction regarding its usage the first instruction would be diluted with warm water before use and the second instruction should be not to be swallowed in excess now since gargles and mouthwashes both are meant to be used in oral cavity it is important to know the difference or to know in comparison how gargles are different from mouthwashes so this slide or basically this slide shows the difference between a gargle and a mouthwash as already mentioned gargles are clear preparations similarly mouthwashes are also clear preparations but gargles are used in posterior portion of the mouth and the usage is by agitating it with exhaled air to produce local effect in the throat so their main focus of using gargle is we generally call it as gargling so when we take the preparation in the mouth we try to swallow it in near to the uvula that is the throat portion we gargle it and then we throw it out of the mouth whereas in case of mouthwash it is also taken in the posterior portion of the mouth and it is just rinsed the mouth is rinsed and it is thrown out so basically the difference it is with the main intention that gargles are to be meant for throat and mouthwashes to meant to be used in the mouth and both are categorized under monophasic liquids meant for oral cavity or we also call it as special use the next difference is that gargles are used to relieve soreness in mild throat infection so generally gargling is done whenever a patient or an individual has a throat problem and they are giving a deodorizing effect sometimes general gargling is for better mouth hygiene whereas a mouth wash is generally used to clean and refresh mouth so for medicinal value mouth washes are less recommended and at the same time mouth washes have good perfume so it gives a refreshing feeling in the mouth and also a good feel and breath would be having perfume next is mainly that the mouth wash is intended for its cosmetic value so as already mentioned it's mainly for enhancing the confidence level of an individual because of its perfume nature gargles on the other hand are highly medicated so basically gargles have an active pharmaceutical ingredient having some therapeutic value whereas mouth washes are rarely having a medicinal agent but sometimes a mouth wash can be used as a gargle because the purpose of mouth wash though it is cosmetic value but sometimes the deodorizing effect is also to be felt from the throat area so it is also confused at many times that gargles and mouth washes are same so the major difference is gargles are to be used in the throat and generally medicated whereas mouth washes are for cosmetic value and are only for cleansing the mouth one prescription example for a mouth wash is popular preparation zinc sulfate and zinc chloride mouth wash it's a official preparation in british pharmaceutical codex this preparation has the following ingredients it has zinc sulfate 2 grams zinc chloride 1 g compound tartrazine solution 1 ml dilute hydrochloric acid 1 ml chloroform double strength 50 ml and finally the vehicle water which is freshly boiled and cooled in order to make up the volume to 100 ml so this is the formula for preparing zinc sulfate and zinc chloride mouthwash now let us look as look into the principle involved in this preparation now the main purpose of using this preparation is in ulcers mouth ulcers so basically this has an astringent ingredient and for wound healing in case of wound healing we refer to the mouth ulcers or the blisters or the wounds which occur in the mouth 
So, in order to cure that we are recommending this preparation. Now, zinc chloride also desensitizes the teeth whereas zinc sulphate and zinc chloride are very importantly highly soluble in water. So, they give us a very clear preparations. The preparation may have liberation of oxychloride which is generally present in zinc chloride and this may make the preparation turbid. The purpose of adding hydrochloric acid is to dissolve this oxychloride which is present in zinc chloride because as a thumb rule liquid dosage forms are clear preparations. So, the turbidity which is coming in temporarily due to the release or the presence of oxychloride that is taken care by adding hydrochloric acid in the formula. Chloroform water is added because of its flavoring property and preservative property and tartrazine is added mainly as a coloring agent. So, as already mentioned liquid preparations are to be clear, should be pleasantly flavored, should be nicely colored for good acceptability. Talking about the third class of liquid dosage forms again oral use external includes or we also call it as special use includes throat paints. Throat paints are different from gargles. Gargles are also liquids, throat paints are also liquids but the major difference is these are referred as throat paints and they are viscous preparations. Very important to note they are very viscous preparations of the medicament or the drug for local action in the pharynx. So, these are taken little deeper in the throat area and it is mainly viscous in nature. The viscosity is brought about by adding glycerine as the solvent system in preparation of throat paints. Now, the purpose of glycerine is being a viscosity imparter and at the same time it will not get washed away faster by saliva because anything when we take in mouth our salivary secretion increases and saliva might drain out the preparation and it will not allow the throat pain to remain in contact with the affected area in the throat to give medicinal value or therapeutic action. So, the viscosity imparted by glycerine will help in attaining prolonged action. Very important to mention with respect to throat paint is throat paints have to be applied with a brush. So, you need a brush to be dispensed along with the throat paint in a bottle and right instruction should be given to the patient. Generally, throat paints are used in the treatment of inflammation of the mouth and throat. Some named diseases or the medical terminology to understand inflammation of mouth or throat are stomatitis, pharyngitis, laryngitis or tonsillitis. So, when a person or a patient is suffering from any of these disease states, a throat paint is recommended by a physician. Talking about formulation of throat paints, the first thing to come in mind is selection of the right drug or the active pharmaceutical ingredient. So, this could be from either the category of anti-infectives or from the category of astringents. So, if anti-infectives are to be considered, some classical examples are phenol, iodine. Now, iodine is especially selected when a condition of pharyngitis or tonsillitis have to be cured. We have also an anti-infective agent gentian violet which can be used to cure oral candidiasis. It is a fungal infection wherein we can take gentian violet and prepare a throat paint of gentian violet and then dispense. Also, the next anti-infective agent which can be taken is boric acid. We also have some examples under astringents like tannic acid. Now, tannic acid is a preferred compound whenever we need to relieve sore throat. So, when an individual suffers from sore throat, the market formulation available is tannic acid throat paint. Since it is an oral preparation, we need to add other additives. Other additives includes flavoring agent. The one which is generally preferred is mentha oil. Now, mentha oil has an advantage that though apart from being a flavoring agent, it also gives a cooling feeling or a coolant, a cool feeling in the mouth. A cool feeling gives a feeling of freshness or a feeling of deodorizing effect. So, that is why 
one has to select a single agent with multiple use in order to have least incompatibilities and better stability in the formulation. And the vehicle system chosen is glycerin as I already mentioned that throat paints are viscous preparations and at the same time glycerin can be taken as a viscosity imparter. Talking about containers for throat paints, now generally throat paints are to be dispensed in wide mouth bottles. This is very important to mention that throat paints are to be dispensed in fluted wide mouth bottles. Now, wide mouth bottles have a bigger mouth and they have a screw type lid. So, it can be made airtight and also it should be supplied with a brush. So, in a cartoon, one has to place a wide mouth bottle and a brush and the labeling instruction should be placed accordingly. The labeling condition are that it is to be used externally only though it is oral use but you are only applying to the affected throat area. This preparation is not to be swallowed. So, the condition of not to be swallowed in large quantity should be mentioned as a auxiliary condition on the label. Talking about its storage, throat paints are glycerine based. So, again it is a trihydric alcohol and it is important to store such a preparation in a cool place. Talking about patient counselling, whenever such formulation bottles are dispensed, the patient should be instructed regarding not to be swallowing it. Second, the application of this preparation is using a throat, uh, throat paint brush and also not to drink water immediately after application because the preparation will get washed down from the throat into the GIT. So, it is very important to give indication to the patient that once you apply the throat paint in the affected throat area by using a throat paint brush, do not drink water for some time. One prescription example for throat paint or the marketed formulation which has is Mandel's paint. This is a popular preparation generally available in the market. Otherwise, it is also called as compound iodine paint and it is official in Indian National Formulary 1979 edition. The ingredients of this preparation are iodine 0.31 grams, potassium iodide 0.62 grams, water 0.62 ml, mentha oil 0.1 ml, alcohol 90% strength 0.94 ml and glycerine to make 25 ml. So, when this formulation is prepared, the principle involved is iodine is an anti-infective that is why it is taken, potassium iodide helps to be an expectorant and this will be useful in dissolving iodine. So, when iodine and potassium iodide are taken together, it forms polyiodides. Polyiodides are better water soluble than plain iodine. So, the, since the preparations are liquid preparations, monophasic preparations meant for internal use, it is very important to mention that the preparation should be clear. And alcohol is also added in order to facilitate the solubility of iodine. Mentha oil is used in the preparation mainly for its flavoring property and glycerine is selected as the vehicle mainly because of its viscosity and preservative property. Talking about the fourth type of formulation, so till now we have discussed gargles, mouthwashes, throat paints, the next in line is ear drops. Now ear drops again if I go with the definition, ear drops are liquid dosage forms, monophasic type meant for special use. These are not for oral, these are referred under special use that is in body cavities. So, by definition, they are generally solutions, suspensions or emulsions of drugs in water or glycerine or propylene glycol. So, fundamentally, ear drops are plain preparations just having active ingredient and a suitable vehicle which can be water, glycerine or propylene glycol and they are intended to be instilled, installation into the ear. So, we use it for the ear purpose and the main purpose of using in the ear is to remove excessive cerumen. 
excessive cerumen is nothing but ear wax it has been observed that the ear wax may lead to hearing impairment or there might be no clarity in hearing so for that reason ear drops are recommended that when ear drops are instilled into the ear it helps in softening the ear wax and then audibility becomes much better ear drops are also used to treat infections inflammation or pain in the ear and for cleaning and drying of ear talking about formulation of ear drops basically the selection importance is with respect to vehicle as these are also viscous preparation the preference of vehicle should be out of either glycerin propylene glycol or liquid polyethylene glycols it is also important to consider that while selecting the suitable vehicle viscosity should be borne in mind these are viscous preparations otherwise if it is too fluid they may go in deeper ear canals and stay there for longer time which may lead to bacterial infections generally anhydrous glycerin is used which is important because this will help to remove moisture from swollen tissue in the ear which might be due to some ear infections and also such a vehicle would help to reduce inflammation and reduce the moisture available for ear infections so advisably sometimes plain glycerin preparations can themselves be used as ear drops also it is important that secretions in ear are generally fatty based so you need to select a vehicle which is immiscible with water and uh, aqueous solutions are generally not preferred for otic use that is for ear use we prefer fatty or immiscible type uh, or non aqueous type of solvents rather we avoid aqueous type of solvents now ear drop formulation the main purpose is as i already mentioned removal of wax so mineral oils vegetable oils or hydrogen peroxide is preferred and the drug category can be either from analgesics antibiotics and anti inflammatory agents preservatives can be from different categories and generally methyl paraben and propyl paraben is selected and compounding procedure is same as that of gargles container for ear formulations are generally in dropper bottles and the patient counseling should be that the head should be tilted to one side and specified number of drops should be placed in the ear and a cotton plug should be placed over it in order to retain the preparation for 15 to 30 minutes and it is very advisable to roll the bottle in hand so that it comes to the body temperature when it is instilled this is a classical example of an ear drop that is sodium bicarbonate ear drops bpc the principle here involved is sodium bicarbonate is generally added in 11 parts of water with its solubility criteria glycerin is used as a viscous vehicle and also to avoid the harsh effect of sodium bicarbonate so this is again a prophylactic preparation for softening ear wax so in today's series we have seen some of the general liquid dosage form monophasic type so today we discussed gargles mouth washes throat paints and ear drops in my subsequent series the other categories under monophasic types will be dealt upon thank you